Why do we find physically attractive people so appealing? Because physical attractiveness is a sign of both health and fitness. Most indicators of health are extremely visible, and when I say fitness, I mean genetic fitness. Not going to the gym fitness, although that does help and I'll get to that later. Whether you're aware of it or not, or whether it's your intention or not, you judge people's physical attractiveness based on their ability to provide you with healthy children. Wait, sorry I should mention that this video is basically only geared towards heterosexual mate selection, so yeah. You may only be playing the field for fun, but when you decide to go home with someone, you're still unconsciously judging them on their ability to produce healthy offspring. You may not want to have children with them and you may just want to have some fun, but your standards for beauty are still based on reproduction. And your standards for reproductive ability are based mostly on what you can see. So what do we find physically attractive? Let's start off by busting a popular myth perpetuated by just about everyone. The media does not dictate what we find physically attractive. If that were the case, different cultures would have different standards of beauty. Instead, while there are some small variations, what we find attractive is similar across cultures and across time. Media portrayals of physical attractiveness just reflect back what we already think is physically attractive. They don't tell us what to find attractive, and what we find attractive has rarely changed. They tell us what's in fashion, but that's about it. If you find that opening fact offensive, you're definitely gonna find the rest of this offensive. Luckily, I brought back an old friend from the gaslighting video to help us out, scumbag knowing better. So, since I'm not an awful person and he is, he's here to say the things that- I can introduce myself. All right, geez. I'm here to say all the horrible things that you're thinking and he's too chicken to say. So if you find something offensive, blame him, not me. It's his opinion, not mine. Let's hope that works. But since I opened this by talking about reproduction and children, let's start off with the fact that most people should hopefully already know. Women find different men attractive based on where they are in their menstrual cycle. When they're ovulating, they're attracted to more masculine or alpha men. You know, the ones that are typically rated higher on the 1 to 10 scale. When they're not ovulating, they're more willing to trade off physical attractiveness and genetic quality for men who are more willing or able to invest in their offspring often referred to as beta men. Basically what he's trying to say is that as long as a guy is rich, he can be ugly. Yeah, in a study that's been replicated so many times, even Mythbusters did an episode on it, when women are asked to rate the attractiveness of men, if they're able to see their income or job title in their bio, they take that into account. On average, they will rate a rich guy as 23% more attractive than if they couldn't see it. Meaning that if he was a 5 without his bio, he's now a 7.3. Women want someone who is better able to provide for their potential offspring. But that's the majority of the time, when they're not ovulating. But they just go by looks when they're in their fertile phase, or they're looking for someone in the short term, or they're in a long term relationship and they're looking for someone to, uh, someone to cheat with. The scientific term for that is extra pair coupling, but yeah. 19% of women in long-term monogamous relationships admit to cheating. Men are no better at 23%, but their standards of beauty don't change based on whether they want long or short-term relationships. In the short term, women want someone who is just plain physically attractive and displays prominent masculine features. Or to put it another way, when women are fertile, they look for masculine genetic traits. When they're not, they look for providers. In order to display that they're providers, men will often make ostentatious displays of wealth Health, otherwise known as peacocking. Gold chains, fancy white shoes, sports cars, giant trucks, you know the rest. Our fashion is often dictated by what we know the opposite sex wants to see. This goes for both men and women. But men also use fashion to enhance their masculine genetic features. Broad shoulders indicate a high level of testosterone during development, and women use that as a cue. So men have figured out that if they wear suits with nice big shoulder pads, they'll appear more masculine. Women will find them more attractive and other men will find them more intimidating. Testosterone also affects the jaw, creating a wider, more square jawline. Which is why some men choose to have a beard, because it accentuates the jawline and makes it look more prominent. You trying to say something? What? No, we're the same... Never mind, moving on. The last masculine feature has to do with your hands. You may have heard the myth that having large hands is also an indicator that you have a, uh... A large D? 
Yeah, that one. The myth that even this guy gets super defensive about. He referred to my hands. If they're small, something else must be small. I guarantee you there's no problem. I guarantee it. Well, it turns out that there's actually some truth to that. Although it's not the entire hand, it's just the ring finger. Well, there is no real correlation between ring finger size and uh, D size. There is a correlation between ring finger size and testosterone level, and women are able to pick up on that. When women were asked to rate the physical attractiveness of hands, men with ring fingers longer than their pointer fingers were rated significantly higher. I don't know how they know know that. But as you'll find with the rest of this video, some of the cues that we use to judge physical attractiveness are incredibly subtle, while others are uh, pretty obvious. So when we talk about what men look for in women, let's get real obvious. Bigger is better. <laughs> He's talking about boobs. I actually wasn't, but you know what, let's start with that. The idea that bigger breasts are more able to provide for offspring is a complete myth. There is no correlation between breast size and milk production. So why is bigger better? Because it's actually not the size that men look for, it's symmetry. This goes for literally everything. Symmetry is the prime indicator of genetic and developmental health. If you are smaller and asymmetrical, it's much easier to hide that asymmetry. But if you're large and symmetrical, you are much better displaying your genetic health. Symmetry is more important than size, but size better displays your symmetry. So men look for symmetry by looking for bigger everything. Bigger boobs, bigger eyes, bigger hips, bigger everything. Which is why, and I hate to put it this way, but Disney knows what men look for, which is why they draw cartoon characters like this. I've always been pretty partial to Ariel, really. I know who Elsa is, but I still haven't seen Frozen, and I won't. So just let it go. Let it go. Anyway, they all have impossibly large eyes, impossibly small waists, and other exaggerated features that men look for. And before you think cartoons only sexualize women, they do it to men too. And just like with men's fashion, women have found ways to accentuate the features that they know men look for. Like with bras and even underwear that make things look bigger. Imagine being able to reshape your backside and achieve that ultimate shapely lifted booty instantly. It's here, Hollywood's hottest new trade secret, booty pop or by making their eyes look bigger with makeup, or a few other examples I'll get to later. But while symmetry is king and size is queen, the ace is definitely age. And just like the ace, it can go either way, since men and women view age differently. When men are looking at women, signs of age are typically negative. The older you are, the less attractive you are. I mean, that's not the best way to say that, but yeah. But there's an evolutionary reason as to why. Age of the mother at birth is a strong indicator of the future health of a child. The magic age for motherhood seems to be between 25 and 30. After that, the risks for prenatal complications, developmental issues, and even things like obesity increases by a lot. So when looking for potential mating partners, age is a factor. But not only because of the potential health of any future children, but the number of potential future children. Since women go through menopause, they have a limited window during which they can conceive. So age is a rather obvious indicator of how much reproductive time they have left. Another major factor linked to age and offspring is how many children they already have. Because women have a limited time to reproduce and the time it takes to conceive, birth, and raise a child is so long, women can only have so many children. Before modern medicine, that number was only about six. And birth order matters. Each successive child has the same increases in risk that the age of the mother at birth does. Not only that, but those previous children are also competitors to any of his potential children. Each child has an increased risk for infant mortality, developmental issues, and later health issues. So men take into account how many children a woman already has when deciding whether or not she's an ideal mate. But age works in the reverse for men. Age of the father has no correlation with the health of their children. And men don't have a limited age range for fertility. So women desire signs of age in men because it's an indicator of health, fitness, and assumed ability to provide. And one of the most prominent displays of age for men is their hair. Gray hair correlates with age and is therefore seen as more attractive. Yeah. However, too much gray hair may be a sign that you're not long for this earth and may not be able to provide for much longer. So there's a delicate balance. But what is definitely not a good hair signal is balding. Because think about it, aside from old people, who else goes bald? Cancer patients. 
Yes, sick people lose their hair. So going bald looks kind of sickly. This goes for both men and women, but since many men naturally bald as they age, they worry about it a whole lot more. So there's plenty of products out there that claim to help combat it. But men also look at women's hair as a sign of health. Across cultures, long hair is seen as more desirable for women. Long hair is a sign of good health, and the longer it is, the more you're displaying several years of good health. Short hair is seen as a sign of illness and infertility. <laughs> and that's why women with this haircut are seen as bitch. Hey, I'm gonna let you speak your mind, but you have to keep it at least somewhat family friendly. Man, whatever. But yes, short hair is seen as both a sign of age and infertility. So naturally, there are hundreds of products out there that help make your hair look as full and healthy as possible. But if that isn't enough for you, you can also get extensions, a weave, or even a wig. But don't worry, men have their own ways to fake their hair, with toupees and even cans of spray hair. It's an amazing powder that clings to the tiniest hairs on your head. It actually builds on itself, leaving you with great, great looking hair. Another thing both men and women look for in a partner is skin quality. It is by far the best indicator of current health. Everyone wants clear, healthy skin, and there's certainly no shortage of products to help with that. But if all else fails, you can just cover it up with makeup. I know, there's a lot of women out there that will say that they don't wear makeup to impress men, they do it for themselves. Yeah, and we all totally believe you when you say that. Look, we all wear things not because it looks good to us, but because we think other people will think it looks good on us. I'm certainly not immune. I already addressed the beard thing, but another example is how I part my hair. This isn't my natural part. I put it here because I think this is the presentation that other people will find most attractive. I keep it center left, but my actual part is way off to the left because I'm right-handed. The side you part your hair on is almost always an indicator of your dominant hand, and both men and women like right-handed people. In movies, almost always the good guy parts his hair on the left and the bad guy parts his hair on the right. It's another one of those subtle cues that we use. Anyway, sorry for the tangent, back to skin. Blemishes, splotches, and acne are all signs of illness and are generally considered unattractive. Scars, on the other hand, chicks dig scars. That's actually true. As long as the scar isn't considered to be disfiguring, women find men with facial scars to be more attractive because it's thought to be a sign of physical fitness, masculinity, and security. Like you fought a bear and won or something. Yeah. Will you get your feet off the couch? All right, sorry, geez. As with other hypermasculine features, this only increases your appeal for short-term relationships. Men, on the other hand, don't seem to care either way about women with facial scars. But another facial feature that both men and women care about is teeth. First of all, having all of your teeth is a major indicator of overall health, but having cavities and other discolorations are signs of poor health and hygiene. Along with releasing oxytocin and increasing your social bond with your partner, one of the primary purposes of kissing is to trade germs and immunities with each other. So if your teeth are rotting out, people don't really want to get all up in that. I've steered clear of talking about what people want when it comes to personality, because individual preference makes that very much more widely than what we consider physically attractive. But there's an old adage that opposites attract, which has been proven wrong time and time again. People generally want someone who's pretty similar to them, not just when it comes to personality, but even social class and education, and even physically when it comes to age and race. The one place where the opposites attract saying does seem to be true is when it comes to immunity. People seek out partners with opposing or complementary immune systems, which you can determine through smell and even taste. Straight teeth, on the other hand, are not an indicator of health, but they do show symmetry, and as I said before, symmetry is king, which is why we put people through the horror of braces, which honestly weren't that bad. You'll even pick up on small things like someone's gait or how they walk and use that as a measurement of symmetry. If they walk with a limp or they're unstable, they're not symmetrical, so they're less desirable. Height is another body cue for health. The taller you are, the healthier you're perceived to be. While men don't seem to care about the height of women, women do care about the height of men. <laughs> so shallow. Women generally want someone who is taller than them, and typically that height difference is about 5 inches. When asked, women will often say that they desire someone who is 6 feet or taller. But the average American and European man is only about 5 foot 9. Pff, yeah, laying down. What? That wasn't even... Alright, well, since you brought it up... I didn't bring it up, you brought it up like 3 weeks ago! All right, you got me, but since this does seem to be a pretty important topic, at least to men, here's a chart showing the average, uh, 
D size of over 15,000 men. Basically, the median size is 5.1 inches. If you're at that length, half of men are longer and half of men are shorter. But again, when asked, many women seem to desire the number 6, which is actually in the 90th percentile. You don't have anything for that? No? Why would I? All right, moving on, I guess. The next whole body indicator of health is body fat, and both men and women seem to desire someone who is relatively thin. The desired BMI for both men and women is 19, which is at the high end of what's considered underweight. And while being too thin is an indicator of illness, being overweight is also an indicator of poor health and diet. And as we all probably know by now, being overweight and obese is linked to all sorts of health issues, so I don't really want to beat a dead horse here. However, this is across cultures. You may have heard that there are some tribes in Africa or the Amazon where heavier women are seen as more desirable. And this is true to a point. The fattest women in those tribes still have a lower body fat percentage than the average female American college student. He's not wrong. Even in those tribes, the heavier women that are seen as more desirable are still within the normal BMI range. No culture anywhere sees obesity as attractive. And to say otherwise is to try and normalize an unhealthy condition and try to blame culture for not accepting it. But that's enough fat shaming for now. Next on the list of awful things is, uh... Ugh, really? Waist to hip ratio. I brought this up before, but there's a reason why Disney draws its cartoon characters with waists so small that if they were real women, they wouldn't be able to have children or even be able to stand up straight. Men look for women with wider hips than their waist. The actual size of either doesn't matter too much. It's the ratio between the two. The ratio that is considered most attractive while still being healthy is 0.7, meaning that your waist is 70% the size of your hips. Again, this is cross-cultural, so even those fat tribes in Africa. Back in the 60s, they came up with that 36-24-36 measurement as the ideal woman, and Marilyn Monroe is often used as the ideal woman. People today still use her as the example of a curvy woman, but Marilyn Monroe only weighed 118 pounds. And her measurements were actually much smaller than the ideal woman, and she only had a ratio of 0.62. But women have long known that waist to hip ratio is important, and that's why they invented the corset. Men's ideal waist to hip ratio is only 0.9, but that's because women put less emphasis on the hips. Instead, they put more on their shoulders. The ideal shoulder to waist ratio is 1.6. And again, just like in cartoons, the more comically large they are, the more attractive they seem. So the next time someone tells you that the media is responsible for our standards of beauty, or that only men or only women are shallow, you'll be able to tell them that they're wrong, because we're all a little shallow. And now, you know better. Hey guys, if you enjoyed that video or you learned something, make sure to give that like button a click. If you'd like to see more from me, I put out new videos every Sunday, so make sure to unconsciously judge that subscribe button. If you'd like more input on my future videos, make sure to follow me on Facebook and Twitter. And if you'd like to watch one of my older videos, how about this one?